Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are on site in Los Angeles, in California. We are gonna be talking about all things Buddhism, all things digitizing artifacts, and we have Jeff Wallman joining us on the show. Hello. Hello. Hello, how are you? Thank you so much for coming on. I really pleasure. appreciate pleasure. it. Super excited for this. Jeff's background is perfect for this conversation. He is 17 years as the executive director emeritus now of the Buddhist Digital Resource Center, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to seek out, preserve, organize, and disseminate Buddhist literature using digital technology. Previously, previous 10 years were in the information sciences, digital archiving, digital library operations, software development, organizational management, strategic planning. He did philosophy in Mekki from Boston University, and he's a 22-year practitioner of Tibetan Buddhism with several Eastern Lamas. Whoa, okay. So, we like to take a big history perspective on things when we jump into conversation, and this is a very unique aspect to what has happened. We, we find ourselves now over a period of evolution, as stewards of earth, and we've had this foundation of collective learning that we've built on top of, yet we've lost so many of the artifacts mm -hmm. along the way. Mm -hmm. And to now be able to digitally log these artifacts, especially when it's something as sacred as the practices of Buddhism mm -hmm. and the wisdoms that come from that is so crucial. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your thoughts on now we have the technology, now we're digitizing these artifacts. Tell us about that synthesis of where we're at mm -hmm. in this moment in history. Yeah, I think the, the key thing is that, that the, the physical culture is preserved digitally so that the oral culture, the living culture, can improvise, continue to recreate itself, regenerate itself. So when you take the physical uh, substrate out, the foundation, the physical cultural foundation out, the living culture really kind of can spin. So um, in, the, in the Tibetan case, it's extremely interesting that over a thousand years, the Tibetans really carefully documented so much of their experiences, uh, so much of their philosophy and their view and the, and the traditions, specifically around spiritual awakening and around um, consciousness, around meditation, around transformation. And, um, you know, the physical form that they encoded it in, uh, there was a premium for the real estate, right? Um, these little block prints, so they had to uh, carve things very carefully. So really the words are, are, are encoded. So essentially this awareness and this view is encoded on the page, and you really need a key to unlock it. So I think that work is gonna, of, of unlocking it, that work is gonna take a couple hundred years, given the scope of what the Tibetans were all about for a thousand years. We call it the long winter effect, right? <laughs> when you have nothing but a long winter, you know, you can tend to get a lot done internally. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. So now this is thousands of years of spiritual awakening and consciousness study that has, again, this long winter period where they can really spend time doing some inward reflection on these, on these topics and then write down these wisdoms. Mm -hmm. And it was etched into wood. Well, in, in cases where etched in manuscripts first and then etched manuscripts, manuscripts, but written down. I think the key is it's written down. Um, the Tibetan paper was hardwood paper, so it's super robust. Uh, the, uh, the surviving manuscripts today are, are really solid, actually, uh, much more so than the modern paper. So um, they wrote things down in, in manuscript form. Um, and then when there was an interest in gathering and in publishing that information, they would carve that into wood. So the whole prospect of carving into wood you know, is very in intensive. So um, that's where uh, there was a lot encoded, like to shorten words and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, it's really interesting and you really do need a key to unlock it. You know, you need a key to um, uh, unpack, 
you know, yeah. really what the meaning of what is being said. Would you say that is then partially due to a limitation in being able to etch into that size of manuscript and also then it becomes like kind of like a compression algorithm of the wisdom? Totally, that, that totally is part of the physical culture. The, mean, the, the role of the physical culture is like an efficiency, you know, to, to try to pack as many words as you can into, into the page. Yeah. Yeah. And then teach us about this. You say you say physical, and then what was the other one? Well, the living culture. The, the living culture. Yeah. So the, the practice, the actual practice. Well, the, actually, in the oral traditions, the explanations. Um, the the you know the way I look at it is that um, culture is living. So, can you preserve something that's living? You know, you can protect its conditions for life. You can protect and facilitate conditions so that it can thrive, but you can't really preserve life in a way. I view culture very much as the same thing, that it's, it's a living uh, entity in a way. Uh, it's a living uh, group experience. And, um, and, and the, the, so when we're preserving the physical form, which is like the, you know, in, in the cultural studies, they call it like tangible culture and intangible culture. The, that's the difference. So you need to preserve the tangible as the foundation, as the bedrock, so that the intangible, the lived experience of the culture can kind of move, can have some connection back to the past, right? Mm -hmm. That's the key thing, I, is, is connecting back in to our ancestors, yeah. Yeah, there's, we, we talk about this so much, but the 100 billion humans that have built all of the foundation of civilization that we have, it's so important to be able to go back and immerse ourselves in the hardships and the, their lives and really get behind their eyes. Mm -hmm. And so take us back the, are we talking about 2000 years? Well, the Tibetan Buddhism, which comes from India, you know, started in the seventh or eighth century. Yeah. So the written record is like from 900 or a thousand um, AD. Okay. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's, about it's a like, thousand. it's about a thousand years total. For the written record. For the written record. And then, but yeah. the, the enlightenment of Buddha is like 2,500 2, years. 2,500 years. And then it was over that period of 1,500 years, it was just orally disseminated. Mostly, but then there was also a lot written, but in different traditions, not in the Tibetan tradition. The Tibetan tradition was much later. It was uh, um, the yogis and the sadhus and the siddhas moved over the Himalaya um, into t the Tibetan regions much, much later. Um, the earlier kind of spreading of Buddhism um, yeah, they wrote down all kinds of, of things in different languages, in Pali and Sanskrit, uh, and went to Sri Lanka, actually to China, um, uh, Southeast Asia. So there was a, there was a big spreading, but the, like the, the stuff that we worked on um, in, in, at the Buddhist Digital Resource Center with Tibetan initially is uh, in Tibetan language, which is a little later. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And we'll get to this, but you are now entering into this is like you know fifteen million pages of of text, and a million per day is being at a uh, million per year, year yeah. is being added across different languages as well, which mm -hmm. in Southeast Asian countries. So we're really excited to, and we'll also be talking a bit about the tech, like the metadata and all this exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. um, this history, this foundation is actually really important because it. Like we, like you said, it's it's really hard to capture the current contemporary uh, archaeology of what's going on. These artifacts between us. Well, we have all the digital data that we're leaving behind, but they're in data silos, and mm -hmm. we'll talk about that too. But to be able to go back and find artifacts that have not been digitally organized and able to be, you know, searched and able to be replicated digitally an unlimited amount of times is super critical. So I want you to, to teach us about, about that. Mm -hmm. Well, there's two, there's two parts of it, really, is the essentially data and metadata, right? So the, the, uh, capturing the, the physical um, form of the culture, like whether it's a book or a piece of art, um, 
capturing that digitally. So taking essentially a photograph, but then you have to describe it. Um, and you can describe it along many axes, right? You can describe it along its kind of uh, biographical, geographical, uh, social, political axes. And so this idea of metadata becomes really important because that kind of situates um, the object or the form that you're, you've preserved uh, in the right context. So without that metadata, you essentially have millions of pictures uh, and you don't know what they are or what they're for. Um, even with like advanced machine learning that can read the content of those images, you really still need a human to evaluate what it is um, and to um, you know, ascribe some categories and basically describe it in a way that honors its context, that, 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 that situates it right in the culture then you know, and now as well. And that's really what Gene Smith was all about, um, is really doing that work. He was an unbelievable polymath of the literature and of the traditions. And so he really encouraged us to um, build a good system that really helped uh, this ongoing effort, you know, so that after he was gone, which I think he was uh, prescient about, that we could continue that work, you know, for generations. Essentially, it's like sophisticated tagging, right? So you, yes. you, you need to be able to do it fast enough, right? Because you have this huge corpus. Totally. And you can't get too involved in it. Yes. But at the same time, you need to assign the right information to it. So, yes. um, yeah, so that, that metadata is really, really, really important because that allows then like searching and organization of the, the digital information uh, to be done. And I think the more and more digital information we have, the more and more the, that kind of metadata context is really, really important. Yeah, it's so interesting how you have this, you, like you said, this corpus of that you need to, uh, that you need to photograph and then you need to add the metadata tags and you need to break it down. And it's good that Gene Smith and you had this, had this push with a big team that, how many, how big was the team? Well, at the beginning, it was just a few people. So, it's, and, and then, you know, the large team was like 10. So it's, it's, now, still, it's now. still a small so, team. So yeah, but yeah. Now it's a it's, testament to what you can do with a small number of people, that's right. right? Yeah, yeah. So that's was, right. <laughs> and so you had to you had to move with like you said the corpus was big so you had to move with a certain amount of speed you couldn't get too involved in every single one of the of exactly. the images so now um, you know walk, walk us walk us through this process of you have the how how do you actually get the metadata tags because how do you know about the 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 geographic and the, um, the all the other tags that you mentioned well you know about those? well the Tibet in the Tibetan books there's often at the end there's these colophon titles which are uh, descriptions of um, who commissioned that work and uh, when and where and uh, you know it's very kind of rich information so in the Tibetan books there, there are often clues uh, in some, in, in many cases, like descriptions of w what the context of that work uh, is or was. Um, so, in that case, it's simply reading, right? But again, it's 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 at, at 15 million pages. You know, it's time intensive. So you need to know exactly how to do that, um, and and a lot of that has to do with. Um, being skilled at what the structure of the work is, right? So, so, and, and then some of it is just simple library science, like this is the title, the author, and the subject, and, you know, straight metadata, what, what is the, the form, the support, the script, uh, what language is it in, you know, those, mm -hmm. those kind of really basic things. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty straightforward. But that information really aggregates really well if you yes. do that well. So the metadata structure, having some flexibility around that so that you can describe what's in front of you uh, is really important. And that really aggregates well, that builds up. And you essentially key all that into a database um, and then provide search and, yes. and everything on top of that. Yeah, yeah. and that's because then you can actually dive deep into 
you have this you have this big data repository and you, I'm able to queue a search that then can then extract that data based on the metadata on the tags that you've set with it which is so interesting and then it was also quite crazy to see that out of the these this what is it a hundred plus thousand uh, books mm -hmm. of of um, of Tibetan Buddhist history and that when you hand it over to other uh, lamas around on the east uh, turn hemisphere when uh, I believe Jean and I think you oh yeah as well, for years yeah were, uh, give them hard drives or yeah, yeah, yeah gave yeah. them a hard drive a USB mm -hmm. stick with mm. the 100,000 plus books with millions of pages on such a small uh, and searchable, that was a, that's a profound moment for, for our ability to really expand the library to more and more people. That was really interesting. Totally, yeah. And that's one of the, one of the wonders and you know, enormous benefits of technology because that, that's just obviously not possible if it's not digital, if it's analog. You know, you can't stuff as much analog information into that size space. So, you know, that, that actually helps the kind of cultural preservation part because then um, what, had hap what happens now to this day is a lot of the work that we did over the past 20 years now is on disk, can travel very easily. And what we've seen was now there's a kind of a revitalization of the literary culture. So um, scans were taken and then new woodblocks were created from the scans and traditional texts were printed from the new woodblocks. So that's, that's not a result we ever thought would happen where it would actually spur a revitalization of the print, the, the material yeah, culture, yeah. the print culture itself. We yeah. thought, oh, well, people will just, you know, print it out with printers or whatever. But now it actually went full circle back into wood blocks. And then, so that was a fascinating and really powerful um, impact result of the yeah. work. Now, I, we'll get a little more into the nuance of the tech. I want to hear about a lot of the, you know, the origin story for you guys. Um, so initially, after your undergraduate, you decided to explore some Nepal and India. Yeah. And, yeah, and then that kind of led you into teach us about this. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just the ultimate expression of naivete, right? I mean, I had no idea. Actually, it was, I was 22 years old, right after college, and I had studied a lot of like Indian philosophy, Chinese philosophy in school at BU. I had some great teachers in the philosophy department. And I painted a couple houses that summer and went initially with a friend to India. And I remember actually arriving at the, the um, airport and the customs agent in India looked at the, my passport and looked at me and then shook his head like, basically <laughs> like, you have no idea what you're getting yourself into. So I don't know what I was presenting, <laughs> but it was sure it was naivete yeah. with, you know, yeah, with long blonde hair and like sparkly, like I have no idea what I'm doing here. And I just was, I was called, you know, I felt really connected to India, always have, still do. Um, um, it's really a beautiful country, you know, I have friends there. Um, but also the Himalaya, like I was traveling with a friend at that time and he, uh, you know, good buddy of mine. And he, after a few months, he was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to Scotland to drink tea on a veranda. And I and it was a joke to this day that we still joke about. I was like, okay, man, you can do that, but I'm going to stay here. And I went to Nepal and I just stayed there for a couple of months. And I remember actually my first encounter with a Tibetan Lama was up in the uh, Kumbu area, which is the area near Everest. And we went up and we walked. It was like three weeks walk because there was, you know, the transport, this was in like 1988, right? So it was a different world there then than it is now. A three week walk. Yeah, I mean, but a lot of people do that. But yeah, it was in good shape and it was fun. Uh, and I didn't know what I was doing, you know, uh, you know, just walking along these paths. Yeah. And you had this idea, like, want to go see Everest and the whole region. And we got to this region, the Kumbu, and 
there's a very famous monastery there and they have this festival where they basically allow, they bring local villagers and visitors into the monastery and you make offerings and they do some ceremonies. And the people I was with were like, why do you want to do that? And I was like, why wouldn't you want to do it, right? Yeah. So again, those things, so where is that coming from? You know, I just have no idea, it's a karma, I guess. And then I remember going to this monastery. Curiosity. Curiosity. Curiosity, and yeah. also the design, you, like you had some sort of an inclination that was, you, you were being drawn out to something that was more ancient than you were. Right. Way, you know, and you wanted to tie yourself into into that right that that's so beautiful i'm glad this is the I, I hope that that can enter into the children being born today as well as go and immerse yourselves mm -hmm. in the ancient when you visit different places around the world and go look in those ancient areas not just the new modern areas oh yeah no so i totally tell my son today you know the sign of a good summer is when you get you know scars and 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 wounds you know it's like you know physical exploration absolutely um so i but i remember this moment and we were walking through this ceremony it was just really a procession and the main lama was doing blessings right to to the villagers and i just kind of jumped in this line mm -hmm. and i remember getting up to this lama and i looked at him and he just looked at me and there was a feeling of love that i had never experienced before it was like this really deep love and i was just like my whole body just melted and i he just smiled at me and it was amazing and I didn't actually touch Tibetan Buddhism for 10 years after that. Not because I was avoiding it, just because I didn't even know what that experience was, except I knew that it was profound. And later on, I see that, and starting to get involved in meditation and so forth, that that, that culture of compassion and love is cultivated. Yeah. And, uh, and very needed, obviously, you know. I don't know what that Lama saw as I was walking through, but whatever he saw, he met, you know, I, I always you know, look at the other side, he met me and I met him and we met together in that space and it was uh, really powerful. Can you tell us more about that feeling of profound love that you felt what was that feeling like and how did that energy sort of keep going with that that was so interesting. yeah it's well it's it's warm <laughs> yeah. and there's no boundaries right there's no conscious ideas it just melt it just flows this flow um, and um, it's right from the heart you know it's not from your thoughts you know or your your brain body from your heart and it just really uh, it was really clear you know and um, I felt like I was remembering something you know I was remembering something in myself that was um, beyond me um, but that I was still connected to and a part of um, and you know my current teacher who I see less now, he's in India, I still have the same feeling when I go see him. It's kind of like, no matter what my state of mind is, you know, there's just a melting of those concepts and that struggle and all of that, just, it's gone. Yes. The, is, I guess the question is, why does it come again? <laughs> but, yes, I want to take this two, two, two interesting But two I interesting definitely places. know it goes away too, so that's good. Yeah. That's good information that that struggle goes away. It's not part of our nature actually. It comes up, but it goes away. Uh, and I, that was one of the things that really struck me about the tradition, yeah. is that, that idea of Buddha nature, that we're awake, we're alive, we're um, awakened naturally that's our natural state that's our first state yeah yeah, yeah. okay there's two there's two um places quick that i want to go you you talk about this 
compassion. You talk about this love, this heart-centric approach to looking at someone else in the eyes mm. and what that does and leaving that positive wake everywhere you go, that mm. positive aura everywhere you go. Mm. That That is so beautiful. And to see that in more children and adults around the world is exactly what we need to get to that unity um, so that we can best prosper moving forward. And practices like this are really really great way to get there. So um, I want you to pick up the story. So after that experience with the Lama, you said it took you like 10 years. So yeah, pick up the the story. Well, yeah, then I did the usual trajectory. I left India. I went back. I had my midlife crisis at age 24. Like, what am I going to do with my life? (laughs) I did the usual thing. You know, I started thinking about my career. Um, and relationships and I moved to California for a few years Uh, then I decided to do graduate school Um, I went to graduate school in math and mechanical engineering for some reason again curiosity like I I think I can do this Um, and then I worked for a few years um, as an engineer and then I started feeling that need again of like okay what am I doing Um, how can I improve my experience how can I improve my happiness you know how can I um, something's missing right Um, so it started to call again uh, that kind of curiosity and that longing and then um, while I was working uh, in these engineering companies I started meditation practice formal meditation practice and I met um, uh, several lamas, and then got involved in a meditation community in Boston, um, and then from there, you know, started retreats, and then saw, you know, that there's a whole formality and path and tradition and yes. teachings in the view and practice, and then it got more and more complicated and more and more incredible that there was so much diversity of practice yes. for each kind of person. And I started to get really inspired, like, wow, this is really an incredible tradition, you know, really an awesome tradition uh, in its diversity and its care. Um, And it's experiential. And it's experiential, grounded in that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so that was, uh, that was, that takes us right into like 2002. And when I, 2001, I I wasn't getting enough time off of my corporate job, so I decided to quit my job, um, and I went on a bunch of meditation retreats um, because I wasn't getting enough time off, right? Um, which I think is something the corporate world definitely needs to take into consideration of letting people deepen their experience so that they can be more creative, creative. in production sure. yeah productive because after that retreat it's like yeah the fire was lit lit yeah totally right. lit and then i through a friend um who i still keep in touch with um introduced me to gene to gene smith and i met him um and instantaneously yeah he was just like well i'd like you to to come work and and help me with the technology so and then it took off yeah Okay, I wanna take us um, to this point that you made about this, um, this diversity of practices of getting to awakening. Yeah. There's a lot of diverse practices. Yeah. And <clears throat> after having done the amount of diverse practices, been at retreats, um, talked to so many people, what 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 can you say? Is it do people just go and and test at different retreats, the different diverse strategies, and then figure out what works best for them? Yeah, and I think that's that's a really important process. I think people uh, need to have, um, in general, just more patience in their own process uh, around that. And I think that the way you, that you evaluate a teacher, the way that you uh, connect in with a teacher is very individual, very personal, and I, I think it's really important to honor um, how you can hear them, whether or not you can hear what they're saying, 
because I've sat in an audience with many very good teachers. They're incredibly learned, but it's like right over my head. It's like I'm, I just don't connect with it somehow. And I think that process of honoring your own, that connection that you feel in yourself when you're in the presence, in that kind of presence, is really important, you know, because that, that spark, that initial connection is really the ground. Um, and and the, so the diversity I'm not talking about necessarily is not necessarily with all these different teachers and traditions, which of course now, today in, in our age, we, have, we are incredibly fortunate to be exposed to so much even with social media, to be exposed with this unbelievable amount of diversity of information. You know, it's, it's unbelievable on some level, right? The abundance of it. Um, there's that kind of diversity, but just even in one vertical, um, the diversity is incredible in the, in the Tibetan tradition um, because there's so many different practices within each tradition, you know, that really kind of get at this the diversity of enlightenment, the diversity of waking up, that there's so many different styles, so many different approaches, there's so many different, you know, from the Buddhist point of view, there's so many different defilements to yeah. purify, right. you know, so there is a real, um, there's a real care taken around uh, constructing practices to, 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 to address that variety. And I think that's where the diversity comes from. Well, that was yeah. really good. So, the, yeah, it's so important for us to look at ourselves objectively in the mirror and realize the defilements that we want to eradicate from our lives and go through these wisdom practices to do so. And also you mentioned this really important that sometimes when you listen to different teachers or mentors, it sometimes information goes over your head, but with other teachers it really sinks right. in and resonates. Yeah. So it's up right. to us to find those pairings exactly. for us. And yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That was, that was a good one. Um, okay, so now I want, to, I want to talk about this. So in 2002, you and Gene end up going, okay, we're going to um, figure out how to add a, uh, properly digitize this. And you, you speak about this as well. It's really important to understand scale is a big uh, deal here. Mm -hmm. If you're only doing a thousand pages, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. When you're doing millions of pages, it becomes a whole different animal. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about that. Yeah. I mean, the scale just influenced this project from the very beginning. Um, at the, one of the first things I did was ask Gene, you know, how many pages are there? You know, so he had this whole um, 7.2 million. So I was like, okay, that's a lot. So like after a few years, I was like, we were at 9 million. I was like, what happened to the 7.2 million? <laughs> it, was, it was just an estimate. You know, I think he like purposely underestimated the, the scope just to, for encouragement purposes, <laughs> right? When he knew it was like way bigger. Um, but that really informed everything at the beginning, how, right down to how we structure the directories on these disks. You know, because the, the other really overriding interest was the preservation, the long-term preservation, and, and making this, this corpus of data, this corpus of material portable, be able to share on disk, you know, eventually print it out maybe, you know, put in a concrete bunker somewhere on yeah. paper. Yeah, yeah. Um, but definitely the, the, the interest of not just building like a archive online where people would go, but also to make sure that the actual data is distributed throughout the planet. Yeah. I mean, he thought about that right from the very beginning. So that, that influenced the architecture, the portability, and then the size. Um, and um, the size fundamentally is like almost like a workflow issue, right? Like you, you just, you, you, perfection can't be the enemy of the good, right? So you have to do a good enough job to make sure that, that what you're archiving is uh, defined well enough, situated well enough in the context in which it was created. Um, but at the same time, you know, given that there's so much, you need to kind of keep that moving. Um, we, at, at one point um, last year, accounted, there were about 450,000 metadata records that, you know, kind of, uh, pointed into the text, so wow. and that was you know keyed in by people, by so people, yeah. yeah, by librarians um, at wow. uh, in Cambridge basically. Yeah, 
and um, and they're still working every day. Yeah. So there's still a lot of production, and and you know there was a real vision about you know those records as kind of nodes uh, in a network, and that the pages were also network nodes in a network, and uh, and how you tag these nodes, uh, and if you are careful and disciplined and you have the you know right amount of information um, it's not too much and not too little then you can make a lot of progress so yeah the scale was really really important uh, from the very beginning because we knew it was was big and then we speak on the scholarly validation side of things yeah that's really critical um, always uh, vet, you know vetting um, the text in the sense that um, being able to uh, you know, disambiguate um, versions and additions, um, making sure that we're not scanning the same thing twice, you know, that, that's a big issue. Um, oftentimes uh, it's not clear, you know, exactly if there were duplicates. Gene always showed us that if you have, if you print uh, a text from a woodblock like 200 years ago, from the time from 200 years ago, which is the first printing, to today, you keep printing, there's variations in the, in the prints because the blocks wear out. Interesting. And, and so that's one problem is the, the, the volatility of the blocks themselves. But the other problem is that there are these kind of what they call editorial redactions in the blocks. So as they're printing, there's recarving and stuff of the blocks. So you see actual differences in the prints, not just the fade, Whoa. but you see these kind of real-time editing mm -hmm. taking place during the printing process. So we always had to be really careful about what is, um, you know, what the edition is, what the version is, what the print is, and to make sure that that information uh, is accurately reflected in the, in the metadata. And that really does require scholars. Um, and so that's, that's a huge thing of what scholars contribute. Um, and just really access to the text and, and the importance of the text and being able to describe, you know, uh, what the text is, what the boundaries of the text is, um, and, and being able to situate things well, and describe things well. Yes, so scholarly validation is critical. Yeah, as you were speaking on that, I was thinking about the craziness of trying to see what a version was like between these hundred year periods mm -hmm. and then and then trying to store that as well as version control basically of saying that oh this is the one from 1400 this is the same page from 1800 right yeah it's like uh, xylographic subversion you know our github you know through xylographs um, I mean, it, it, to say that there's a, a ton of variation in the blocks themselves is kind of overstating it it's to make a point that the blocks are not static. Yes. And that's definitely, yeah. because you're doing this cultural preservation work, look at it from kind of a, almost a management perspective. It's so expensive, you know, to, to, to preserve material. Like, you're at the point of preservation, you know. You've flown across the world, you, you've traveled, uh, you know, a hundred miles in a Jeep. Uh, you had all, have all this equipment that comes together. You need to go to this location. You need to sit down and set everything up and people need to agree to that. And then you actually start to photograph a text. And at that moment, you make a rash decision and you say, oh, we have this already. You know, that's like, a, that's a real danger. So that's part of it is that really to make sure that, that you are really serious about when you say we have it already. And of course we joke a lot in our organization about, about uh, we have it already, that whole comment. Whenever, <laughs> whenever when anyone says we have it already, I always say, are you sure? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? that's funny. And that, that's definitely the, the that's genes. That's a funny myth. joke. Yeah. And with old text, this is really important. You know, manuscripts, you know, manuscripts are unique. There are different um, instances and different events around how they were produced and 
So with old culture, it is really important to make sure that you really look carefully. You also explain this crazy flying across the world with all the equipment, traveling in a Jeep to the location, setting it all up, and then you either you know you have to get permission from them to do it, and then you realize maybe we have this already, maybe we don't yet. Well, is this a different version? How so? Um, and so you're still identifying the million that are pages that are being added every single mm-hmm. year and across all these new languages as well. So you're right now, Thailand has a big focus. So mm-hmm. Thailand, Cambodia, Mongolia, yeah, Mongolia as yep. well. Um, yep. Uh, Burma, mm-hmm. um, what Nepal, Nepal India, yeah. India. Those are the big yeah. ones. Yeah. So, so, um, so, 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 tell us about how these are different ancient texts from the from the, from the from the cultures of of Buddhist Buddhism around different kind of Southeast Asian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, over a couple hundred years, they accumulated these, and now you're aiming to log those with the Tibetan ones in a single searchable, mm-hmm. and you would then search them by Tibetan Buddhists or by um, Thai Buddhists, etc. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and just really trying to basically repeat the model of what we did with and continue to do with Tibetan, repeat that in other cultural regions where there were, were a lot of texts or where there are a lot of texts still um, still present. Um, and, and that part of that again is like the scholarly validation where the important collections um, and it's really important to work with uh, you know really good scholars. Um, in Thailand um, we set up shop at a, a, a legendary scholar's house who basically did the same thing as Gene Smith, but he did it with Burmese and Thai manuscripts. And this was floor to ceiling, three stories high, and we just page by page. And those are all etched in palm leaf. So the material support of the text is palm leaf. So you have to actually, um, in order to activate the, the etching, you have to uh, clean, the te- the, clean the text and you have to put uh, kind of oil on it, and the oil activates the the script so that Whoa. you can see it. So that has to be cleaned page by page, and there are like twenty-two thousand volumes of text in that collection. Um, but it's the same process: digitized, which is photograph, and then describe with the metadata, and that that's going to take um, a while. <laughs> At least but I'm retired, others. so other people are doing <laughs> that now. <laughs> I'm there to stop. Yeah, yeah. It's, it was really interesting. You said someone else there was doing Thai and Burmese, which was, that's really cool that other people around the world also have this interest in collaborating on digitizing. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Because essentially, you know, you, you're, if you're interested in books, you know, your life work can be about collecting. But when you amass this collection, then what? You know, that's where the digital is really powerful. Okay, well then we can digitize that collection and it's much easier to browse through. You know, it's much easier to kind of retrieve and find. It's not easier to read and understand that you still have to do that work, but just the kind of whole organization of it. And then the, the, the durability of it after you pass away, you know, you can be ensured that the, the collection, the digital version of the collection is available, you know, um, instead of the risk of it being put inside an institution where it's not available anymore and so on. So, yeah, the, these efforts of working with the schol- scholars that have collected large amounts of material is, is really critical. And then you've open sourced. This is actually kind of this is really crazy. These artifacts, when they're in silos, as we were talking about earlier also with technology industry and our data, it makes it more difficult for us to add our creativity to augmenting and evolving the, this foundation of knowledge. Right. And so, this is so strange, the private collections of mm-hmm. of, of, of um, of art, civilizations, artifacts, right? Op- 
we need to get to a point where we're open sourcing and letting people scan and enter that in digitally and build on top of these things. Right. Yeah. yeah there's lots of different layers to that. Right. There's the 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 sharing of the the data itself. Um, you know the 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 photographs or the images or the scans of the the, the source material. Then there's sharing the metadata so that uh, it can be machine harvested. Uh, that was another thing that we did uh, at, at BDRC is to ensure that the metadata structures that we created could be harvested by machines. Um, and then all the source code about how you build the archive, how you archive it, uh, how you archive the material, um, and all the code that you write, you know, that is all open source too. So like the three layers, you know, um, all has to be open for these large projects. Um, and I think that there are a lot of methodologies now, like including the semantic web, which is something that we're working on um, um, now. I continue to be interested in it, which is these are strat like information strategies about how to structure your data so that it's machine readable uh, and machine understandable uh, by other machines. So if we can get to a, a, a point where uh, it's fine if information's in silos, right? Um, because these collections are physically in silos. Um, it's that's okay. They just the the boundaries have to be porous. Mm -hmm. Porous boundaries. Yeah, that's real. That's what needs to happen. Because I don't think the silos the problem. I think it's the boundaries that are a problem. The boundaries are locked down, yeah. and then you can't have access except for one portal, and that just really undermines the kind of interoperability of the of the information. To have the portability of machine readable data. For, formats, exactly. Formats. Yeah. 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 And of course this was kind of the original in, intention in building the internet itself by Tim Berners Lee, right? Is to have an internet of exchange, not just a publication channel or a harvesting channel, but actual exchange, so that machines could actually talk to each other more effectively. You know, and he designed a whole language and, and programming language around that. So, yeah, maybe we could return to that. That's actually quite interesting as a part of our future is the ability, especially as we enter like Internet of Things and um, you know, autonomous vehicle age and all of our connected devices across all of the facets of our lives that, that that ability for data to be able to be read in machine readable portable formats is, is so interesting and crucial. That way the talking can actually happen more easily. Um, I want to I want to hear about the other ties. How are um, you know we, we kind of talked about how you know you're doing this now this next one million uh, each each year additional pages and working with different um, Southeast Asian um, countries to add the Buddhist text. I'm curious. Um, what about Himalayan art resources, Tibetan Himalayan Library, Rubin Museum of Art, Treasury of Lives? Can you teach us about those? Yeah, sure. And there was a lot of work in the 2000s, you know, of using technology um, to look at uh, various uh, aspects of, of the culture. Like, so the Himalayan art resources is still very much about uh, looking at the art uh, and doing a similar process on you know, really accurately cataloging the art and making it available, kind of collecting digital images, cataloging stuff, search. So that, you know, that's definitely an incredible uh, project, an incredible effort. Um, the Tibetan Himalayan Library in, in Virginia, um, um, they're doing a lot of work surrounding kind of the underpinning, uh, technological underpinning of things. They had done a lot of work that entered into the open source space regarding Tibetan language and ensuring that Tibetan language is accurately represented and supported in, in the digital world. Um, and they've continued to do a lot of work around intangible culture, um, dictionaries and things like that. So, um, you know, was, at the beginning in the 90s and the 2000s, there was a lot of grassroots efforts um, to start this work uh, kind of on behalf of the Tibetans. Um, and um, 
and some amazing projects kind of emerge from that space. Actually, a, a, a very much a kind of nucleus around around Gene because Gene's actually connected to all these projects. Um, you know, actually, the reason original reason why we moved down to New York City was because of the Ruba Museum to help establish that museum. So now it's a fully fledged organization that that has its own mission and is doing great work. So, yeah, those were kind of like the the uh, the wild years, the early years, you know. Yeah. So things have definitely matured. Technology has matured. The internet has matured. Um, there was no Facebook or or. Uh, I remember when we started. Actually, it was hard to email an image. I don't yeah. know if you remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Probably too young yeah. for that. <laughs> but you Stuff couldn't email, email image, yeah. an image. Yeah. Like the. The whole machine would the choke, and then it would go slow, and large, it was yeah. like unbelievable. Yeah, so yeah. things have really opened up, and and things have been become much more, um, much more fluid. Yeah. And you know, like we were talking about before, I think the the main issue now is, uh, is is decentralization. Yeah, talk about this. So this is yeah. kind of where you. I want to also say that it's so cool that you're working with these different kind of symbiotic orgs because. They're all doing in a way the, uh, the 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 archaeological logging of the preserving cultural heritage, and that is so crucial for us moving forward. And you know, Rosetta Project, Long Now's project, we love you guys so much. Mm -hmm. um, this is these are the things that are going to enable us to look back and say thank you, thank you for putting time into logging this so we actually have a record of it because um, so many things have just gone in the dust right and it's so sad that they did because we could so better understand where we actually came from mm -hmm. if we did if we did keep those so so tell us about you know what is next for you you mentioned decentralization so mm. yeah tell us about this yeah so um, as we're this definitely is informed by my experience working with uh, Tibetan texts. Um, there are the holders of these traditions and the holders of the, the texts themselves. Um, there needs to be some representation or some voice of individuals and of individual organizations. So even as we're doing work and, and still do this work, uh, there was always a sense of like, okay, well, this is my text and now I'm going to give it to you. Like, how does that work? So then we have uh, um, licensing, you know, being able to describe that relationship and licensing and, and so forth. And I think the original kind of vision of the internet was not that. Um, it was that actually individuals could be actors on the internet and that actors could relate directly with each other. And I think that the more and more centralization that's happened, which is good in the cultural case, you know, it's very good because those centralizing efforts had an effect of preserving large amounts of, of information. But I think in the future, um, the, the network is sufficiently distributed throughout the planet that um, individual actors and individual organizations could have directly their own say. And uh, individual consumers could have directly their own say about what they're interested in. So I want to I wanna work on that. I want to start to move in that direction. Um, and all of the silos that were created uh, could become still are totally relevant in that space, right? Because they are the storehouses. Uh, of information and they're the great contextualizers, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the role of a library in the age of the internet. You know, they still have a role even though you can get stuff everywhere, like the entire internet is essentially a library. You know, these individual libraries are concentrations of, of knowledge and of context. Yeah. So I think you can have both, but I think the move to decentralization is really needed because information has gotten so consolidated in these large uh, companies that um, it, it's affecting uh, 
it's affecting people, right? I mean, uh, election disruption is just one example, yes. but yes. just having uh, what you see, uh, you know, heavily weighted by AI uh, based on AI, the AI's uh, view of you <laughs> yeah. is, you know, is kind of concerning, you know, yeah. for me. Um, and um, so I like the decentralization move because it actually allows the individual creators to have their own voice and have individual consumers connect directly. And that to me gets more at the, what culture is in the first place. There's definitely a big concern with psychometrics, profiling and artificially intelligent bot targeting deep fakes this is a this is a, pr a pressing time for portability and and, mm -hmm. and machine readable data formats and um, open a stronger passion for open source and unity and i think what can eradicate a lot of the malevolence in the world is a lot of these practices that you are digitizing mm -hmm. because and i want to i want to touch on this as we get to these final questions this as we talked about this process of inward reflection and meditation and awakening it drives a really deep profound sense of love and compassion into our lives and then we carry that around as a wake everywhere we go mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it can it, it can solve this most these most pressing challenges as we move into this exponential technology age yeah i think we owe it to ourselves we owe it to the world to not lose our humanity in the face of AI. I feel like that is what I can offer AI. AI is gonna try to figure out what I'm all about through its own analysis. But as a human, like I can offer back to that system how I think and what, I, what concerns me. That's what we have to remember you know, that we're creating these systems, you know, we're creating these systems that then we have struggle with. And, and that struggle and that concern is very much our responsibility to continue to express, you know, and I think that the more and more we can ground ourselves, you know, in the organic experience of meditation, of consciousness, of awareness, of love and compassion, and of this planet, of the earth itself, and the wisdom of right. the physical world, you know, that, 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 that's what we can offer uh, the digital, you know, uh, as the digital becomes more and more independent of us. Uh, we can offer that and not forget that. And, and I, I think about that all the time when I'm in my feed, you know, I'm like, why is this coming into my feed? You know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, it, you know, my reaction to it is actually really important to not forget. Yeah. Yeah. You, we, we, t we talked about this a bit. It's quite interesting to think about the next evolution of, of intelligence on Earth from single cell to multi cell to animal to human to potentially an artificial general intelligence and really being able to bring some sort of a of a, of this humanity of a heart centric mm -hmm. theory to to the to the machines will be will be quite interesting and challenging and I and I look forward to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, the couple questions on the way out. What's a core driving principle of yours? It's got to be love, and it's been so many ups and downs, and so many, um, so many struggles, and so much obstacle. Uh, one Tibetan teacher said to me, "It's like if you want to do something good, you're going to have a lot of obstacles," and you know I like that. But what really has, you know, pushed me through. Um, is that you know I'm not going to think my way out of this, yeah, and um, and that love is uh, is the medicine. 
That's such a good quote. If you're going to do something good, there's going to be a lot of <laughs> obstacles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. And you got to get through those adversities so that you can bring that good to the world. And it dry, that will bring the most meaning to your life by doing that. Mm, that's good stuff. And love is the medicine. <sighs> yeah. How about if you could rebuild civilization from scratch how would you design it <laughs> we need an architect to answer that question i think we would need to um just live more in harmony with the with the natural world and um, I think that the abstraction that we have to overcome, that these spiritual disciplines call us to overcome, are created, you know. And I think that, um, that if we live more in harmony with uh, other beings and uh, with the natural world, um, that I think we would have less uh, alienation, you know? It's the abstraction and the alienation which drives so much of our, our uh, craziness. Um, so I think that really groundedness um, of, of Earth-based wisdom is really, I think we should stick to that. I think we should go back to that. I think we had, a, a, you know, it's like 5,000 years, yeah. you know? Yeah. I think yeah. our experiment is complete. <laughs> You know, so I, I really feel like um, is earth-based wisdom and, and that kind of harmony, um, that feeling that we get when we're in a place of presence, you know. Yeah, um, yeah that, that was so good, that earth-based wisdom um, and that it is quite likely that thousands of years ago civilizations had a stronger connection to earth-based wisdom than we do now mm -hmm. and although we may have scientifically probed and and whatnot and um, there may still be some some patches of this deep spiritual connection to earth and that wisdom around the world a lot of the children being born today aren't being taught that heart-centric love and compassion mm -hmm. we're intellectualizing everything mm -hmm. So this leads us into the next question about what would be the one thing that you could recommend to, to parents, teachers, and kids to, to get them on that heart, compassion, love side of things? Yeah, be outside, you know. Um, learn the wisdom of fire. You know, look at a fire. Make a fire outside, you know. Um, appreciate uh, appreciate the abundance that we have you know I think that gratitude is really the most important thing because that undercuts everything you know if we're if we're grateful for the abundance the this opportunity if we're grateful for where we are right now you know that drives a lot that drives us in the right direction yeah you know? those were great gratitude is so crucial and also that going out into nature and a, a wise man sees a different tree than a fool <laughs> right <laughs> it's such an interesting quote <laughs> right. Yeah. right yeah yeah a wise man is 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 seeing the roots is seeing the underground it's seeing the connection to all the other intricate nutrients in the soil it's seeing the animals play in the exactly. tree it's seeing the the sunlight hitting the leaves in the process of photosynthesis and yeah it's seeing a totally different tree than one that's just doesn't realize the sheer complexity of that and mm -hmm. and i think that same thing can be applied to civilization a wise man sees a civilization sees an earth mm -hmm. with that love and consciousness differently than a fool and so to train the faculties mm -hmm. of the children mm -hmm. of the adults is so so important mm -hmm. yeah and we know how to do it you know i think we just need to remember do you need to remember? Yeah. Yeah. What exists past our 3D reality? Um, other realities which we can't imagine, right? Um, is it, does it look the same? 
I don't know. I can't really imagine them with my 3D kind of consciousness. But um, yeah, I often have have uh, you know dreams and visions and stuff, and and uh, uh, that dreams are a lot of information is in dreams, and uh, I think we have to kind of own you know, that as well. So are dreams a part of uh, beyond the 3D reality? I think definitely, because they're not actually uh, dimensional, mm -hmm. but yet they're still there and they still have a lot of information in them. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> dreams are so interesting. Hmm, okay. <clears throat> How about we ask you about time? What is time? Um, well, there's like, I always, when I was studying a lot of math, it was always interesting that you had uh, time as an axis. So like you would have, uh, which is the fourth dimension, right? So you have this 3D dimension, but then it's changing in time. So I always found that like really compelling and that there's a math around uh, the rate of change. You know, so I, th I think that time uh, is simply uh, an expression of the rate of change, um, of, the, of, of impermanence, mm. the decay or the birth. Mm. Um, and do you think this is a simulation? that we're in now. Um, I have no information to deny it or to affirm it. <laughs> it very well could be. <laughs> if this is a simulation, then, then everything is a simulation, right? Right, that's very possible. How, how, can, we, how can we negate that? Yeah, I think we have to, we have to accept that possibility mm. yeah but we still have responsibility absolutely yeah totally yeah just because it's a dream doesn't mean you don't act well oh because it's yeah. because it's a dream it almost makes it even more, more important important to, right to to level up and do your due purpose exactly. here on 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 this in this character experience for you exactly and then wherever we move to the next yeah. character experience yeah you know. it's like the you know what are the what is the ethical foundation of our avatars in the digital space mm -hmm. and the answer is simply that it's the same you know just because it's your avatar doesn't mean you don't have the avatar doesn't have ethical boundaries yeah. it's it's the same the digital you have to have the, the continuity of our intention yeah, like the, the bringing in the, eth the, the ethical idea of never, ever killing, ever, mm -hmm. ever. Yeah, it's just it's, it's destructive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> An awakening to that degree for everyone would be... Mm. <clears throat> <laughs> Last question. Okay. What's the most beautiful thing in the world? Our connection. And uh, the wind that we feel when we're connected. Which part of our connection? Tell us about that wind. It's uh, just our connection to, uh, you know, we're not alone. We're, we're, we're symbiotic with everything around us. Yes. And um, 
the interconnectedness. The interconnectedness. And then yeah. what's the wind? And the wind is just the the aliveness of that. Oh. The sparkle. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love it, Jeff. This has been super <laughs> fun. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you so good. much for My coming to the show. Thank you. <laughs> this yeah. has been super fun. Really good. Really yeah, good. really fun, really fun. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate you. Thank you so much. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the topics we talked about. Also, go and check out the links below. We'll have all of the links that we mentioned in the show. Check them out. Learn more about what we're doing to preserve the cultural heritages from around the world. Also, everyone, continue supporting great organizations and supporting us as well so we can continue doing cool things like coming on site to talk to awesome people like Jeff. And go and build the future, everyone. Go and manifest your destiny into the world. And go and do that heart-centered compassion practice. Do that with yourself. Do that with your family, with your friends, your coworkers, with people around you. Let's get that roaring around the world. Much love, and we'll see you soon. That's it, cool. man. That's cool, it. man. That's it. Awesome. Good job. Thanks. That was fun. That was really fun, yeah.